uh, well done for everyone to, for making it to this point and joining us today. Um, quickly, um, the kind of aim of this weekend away, a weekend at home, was to see was to see kind of the music uh, behind uh, a section of the gospel. So we started in Exodus, where we kind of tried to tune our ears to what's kind of what's the melody that is being sung again and again throughout the Bible. And we saw that it was that um, the God, Yahweh, uh, delivers from slavery for covenantal relationship with him. And we saw kind of how that motif kind of rang throughout the Old Testament, but each time there was a problem. And the problem was people. (laughs) People wouldn't repent. They had uh, something wrong uh, with them. And then yesterday we got to um, Mark chapter 6. And we we kind of saw this awesome bit in Mark chapter 6, the feeding the 5,000, where you get this kind of, announcement in in action the the melody is back uh, and you see jesus perform kind of a little exodus like thing so uh they're in the wilderness and the the he has compassion on them he wants to lead them because they are like sheep just like moses and then he provides bread from heaven just like Moses. Um, And then he kind of walks safely on the waters, just like Israel did, just like Moses. But I'm kind of after the high of the kind of Exodus melody back in full force, this new Exodus, we then get the same problem again. The the Pharisees come and Jesus points right, he puts his finger right on the problem. The problem is your heart. Pharisees, you have a hard heart, a heart that is like stone. That is the problem. And then today we're gonna we're gonna look at some some more of Mark. Um, and in kind of very marky fashion, uh, we're getting something a bit like this again. We're getting scenes in a movie, uh, scenes in a movie with a backing track, uh, a music that makes it all make sense. Um, so we're just going to go through those scenes and we're going to see what is each individual scene saying and then how do they come together to say something together. Is that okay? Put a thumb up if that's okay. Great. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, a good old virtual background. Open your Bibles at Mark 7, and we're going to kick off from uh, verse 24. Can everyone see that? Yeah, good. Okay, we're going to kick off from here and we're just gonna as we go we're gonna notice all the details that mark wants us to notice okay all the details that he points out so we've just done with the pharisees uh, where jesus said they've got hard hearts they ignore god uh they put their own traditions above the the word of god and then we're presented with this lady <clears throat> Verse 24, Jesus left that place and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. Interesting, Mark wants us to know where Jesus is and where is he? Well, he's in Gentile region. He's in the region of uh, the Gentiles, the kind of historic enemies of God. He's not where the Jews live, he's in the area of the enemies of God. Interesting. He entered a house. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, 
As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Now listen to the emphasize, emphasis that Mark has. What is, what is the thing he wants you to know about this woman? The woman was a Greek. She was a Gentile. Born in Syrian Phoenicia. The kind of absolute enemy of Israel. And she begged Jesus to drive her out the demon out of her daughter so mark really wants to get you this jesus is in enemy territory and a woman who was born a gentile who is from an area that is an enemy to god comes up in fact um we can read from kind of tradition and kind of writings jewish writings around this time uh, the jews thought of these people from syrophoenicia as dogs that's what they wrote about them that's how little they thought of them that's how far outside of god's chosen people they were and then jesus says something really weird verse 27 first let the children eat all they want he told her for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. This is odd, isn't it? Has Jesus just called this woman a dog? Has he just done what kind of everyone else in the time did? Treated these people like dogs, like enemies? It certainly sounds like it, doesn't it? But then kind of see, see what happens. See, I think what Jesus is doing here is like a bit of a test to see where her heart really is. She says, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That's interesting, is it? She goes, yeah, I am a dog. I don't, by birth, deserve anything. But even dogs can get some crumbs. Do you see how different her reaction is to Herod that we looked at yesterday and the Pharisees. See, Herod and the Pharisees, they think they deserve something because of how they're born. And they're, that's made their hearts hard. They think they, they think they sit above the word of God. But this lady, she is unbelievably, extraordinarily humble. I'm a dog, but Jesus, I think you've got crumbs for me. And she's right. Verse 29, for such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her daughter lying on the bed, the demon gone. See, Jesus, he gets out of her what she's really about. She is humble. Her heart is soft. She's completely different to the Pharisees. And this enemy of God, this Gentile, this person who is as far away from God as you could possibly get, Gets the blessing. Get these glorious crumbs. What a woman. <laughs> and I think uh, Mark has purposely put her here as an example. Don't be like the Pharisees. 
be like this woman. It's crazy. It's, she's a Gentile, but be like her because she's got something right. And I find it amazing is think how Marx also fit this together. Think what kind of a beautiful thing he's doing here. I mean, crumbs, that's what she's asked for. She's asked for crumbs. And we've seen crumbs, haven't we? If anyone knows, think about where we have seen crumbs in this weekend away. Well, just two stories before, right? When Jesus feeds the 5,000, what do they do? They pick up baskets and 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 baskets of crumbs. And you start to see what Jesus is doing here. Actually, the children eat first in the feeding of the 5,000, but there is a heck of a lot of crumbs. And all of a sudden, this story starts weaving together. Jesus is doing something new. But at the moment, it's only a theory. We've only got, you can't see that, can you? <laughs> um, we've only got one scene here. Let's move to the next scene, see how that adds to the story. Oh, there you go. Scene two of today. Um, actually, would someone mind reading it? Josh, would you mind reading this? Yeah, just what you've got on there. Yeah, just what I've got on there. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh, said to him, Epithatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He, make, he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Great, thanks, Josh. Again, Mark really wants us to see the geography. It's weird. Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and he went through Sidon, another Gentile place, uh, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis, another Gentile place. It, Again, he's, he's with the Gentiles. And what happens this time? Well, a man who's got nothing to offer is brought to Jesus. He is deaf and he can't speak. Nothing to offer. But Jesus heals him. He opens up his ears. He lets this pagan hear him and after hearing he speaks very interesting we're starting to put some things together aren't we scene one a Sinophoenician woman is saved scene two um, a man from the Decapolis who is deaf and mute, is saved. Interesting. We're going to go to our third scene. And this one seems a bit familiar. So I'm going to suggest that uh, what happens now is that we go into some breakout rooms. And I'm going to ask you, what is similar about this story? And what is different? 
what is similar about this story and what is different? And why do you think um, Mark has included a very similar story to one we've already seen? Um, who's in charge of breakout rooms? Chuck us into breakout rooms. So you're looking at verses, you can see it there, um, one to 10 of chapter eight. Oh, guys, okay, cool. Everyone's mad. Okay, um, would anyone like to unmute and say some things that are the same as uh, the kind of feeding the 5,000? Anyone? Both times it's in the in a remote place slash the wilderness. Yes, both times it is in the wilderness. Great. Anything else? Um, Jesus is sorry to people. Yeah, Jesus has compassion on people. Exactly the same. Anything else? There's fish and bread. There's fish and bread. Exactly the same. Go on, Hannah. The disciples don't really get what's going on. The disciples don't really get what's going on. Very true. Anything else? There are leftovers. There are leftovers. Exactly. Loads and loads and loads of crumbs. This time seven instead of 12. So my question is, has Mark just put in the same story twice? What's, what's the point of it? So what is different? Anyone can unmute and say what they think is different. The 5,000 one is um, for the Jews and is in the Jewish territory because it is in Galilee. Yeah. The 4,000 one is in a Gentile area, just like, uh, like, close to the capitalist, I think. Yeah, during those days, i.e. in the days where Jesus is going through the vicinity of the pagans, of the enemies of God, he does exactly the same miracle. And this is huge, okay? Uh, let me, this is huge. I'm going to bring back some classic, amazing drawings. Um, this is huge. If we're listening out for the melody um, of what's going on in the backgrounds of these scenes, we see a dog, a pagan lady saved. We see a man, a pagan man saved. He can hear and he can speak. But it's not that Jesus is just about saving the odd person here and there. No, I think the feeding the 4,000 is the second best miracle in Mark behind the resurrection. Why? Because this is the moment where Jesus says, I am the new Exodus, the Exodus God who comes to rescue people from slavery for covenantal relationship. And you know what? I'm here to do that in the Gentiles. I think this is, this is almost the moment that CEUs across the country can hang their hat on and go, we're important. What we're doing is really important. Why? Because the God who makes it his mission to save wants to save us pagans us gentiles this i think is the second best miracle in mark's gospel not because jesus was just wanted to feed slightly less um slightly less amount of people no it's the moment he's saying i am the new exodus and i'm not just the new exodus for israel I'm the new exodus for everybody. It is huge. It is absolutely monumental moment. And as we kind of 
tuned our ears to the melody of the Bible, we start to see how glorious this is. This is why we're all included. It is this moment where Jesus announces that he is the God of Gentiles that makes us confident to come like this woman as dogs, as complete outsiders, as people who don't deserve anything, we can come and ask for God's abundant crumbs. We can come as pagans who can't hear or speak. And do you know what God does? Do you know what Jesus does? He makes us able to hear and he makes us able to speak. Speak about all the things this glorious rescuing God does. Now, I think this is a huge moment. I don't want to move on to the next bit without giving it its due honours. So I thought we'd go back into our breakout rooms and we'd pray just for five minutes. Thank God that he is this kind of God, the God that wants to rescue pagans. Send us out into breakout rooms and we'll pray. Oh, there you go. Um, awesome. I hope you kind of got to feel the high of those three kind of stories like it really is a massive massive high in the bible when we're kind of this big kind of through action announcement that jesus is not only yahweh the god who rescues but he's the god who rescues pagans and therefore, because that is such a high, I hope you feel the low of the next couple of verses. Sorry, I don't have them on the screen, so you're going to have to follow in a Bible. Um, but we're looking at chapter 8, verse 11. Now I'll just read it and show us how absolutely low it is. So Jesus has performed miracles. He's fed 5,000. He's fed 4,000. And then this happens. Verse 11. The Pharisees became, they came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. And I'm not surprised, are you? That Jesus is like, <sighs> they're asking for a sign when he's just fed 5,000 people with bread, fed 4,000 people with a few loaves of bread. These Pharisees, these hard hearted people that should know better, just want sign. And Jesus knows. A sign after all the signs that they've already seen won't do anything. Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them and got in a boat and he went to the other side. So the Pharisees don't get it, even though they should. But surely the disciples do, right? And then we sink even lower. Now, they, that's the disciples, this is verse 14, had forgotten to bring bread. They only had one loaf with them in the boat. And you'd think, oh, the disciples, surely now they wouldn't be nervous about only having one loaf of bread for 12 of them after they've seen what Jesus does. But verse 15, and he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, Belair, 
the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. We've discussed that a little bit. This unrepentance, wanting a sign, having a hard heart. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. I mean, it's a disaster, isn't it? I mean, besides the fact that you've got the God of the Exodus who multiplies bread sitting in the same boat as you. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And for the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? I mean, how crazy is this? It's completely mental. The disciples have seen this happen. They've literally recounted it to him. You had, after you fed 5,000 people with five loaves, we took up 12 baskets. Okay, okay. After, after feeding the 4,000 people with seven loaves, how many baskets did you take? Oh, seven baskets, okay. And they're still worried about not having enough bread. It's ridiculous. It is an absolute load. But if we are still listening to the tune, the melody of Exodus, we're not that surprised. See, this is the way it's been throughout the whole Bible. God reveals himself to be the glorious rescuer from slavery for covenantal relationship, but people mess it up. There's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with their heart. Here, Jesus makes it clear. They've got hard hearts. They, don't see. they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. Something needs to happen. And we're going to go back to our breakout rooms. That's scene one. Scene one, they're in a boat. That is a terrible boat, isn't it? They're in a boat. And they're worried about only having one loaf of bread. I'm going to get you to split up the next. So the next two scenes, one scene goes from verse 22 to uh, 26. And the next scene goes from 27 to 30. And I'm going to tell you that this scene is really weird. But what I want you to do is try and figure out why does Mark do this sandwich? There's a little sandwich here. Why does he do the sandwich with a weird scene, a weird miracle in the middle? Cool. Um, so first of all, would someone just be able to tell tell us what happens in each scene? Could someone tell us what happens in this scene? Sure. Um, so Jesus um, goes to Bethsaida and there's a blind man and he takes him out of the village and spits on his eyes um, to heal him. Um, and he has to do this twice um, and then tells him not to return to the village, but to go straight home. Very good. It's a bit weird. It's a bit of a weird miracle, isn't it? Yeah, it kind of has this weird kind of interstep where he kind of gets healed and then there's, he sees the trees and then, and then he gets fully healed. Okay, great. Um, that's my attempt at drawing that. Cool. And then what happens here in this scene? Anyone? That's all right, I can take over. Do we get this big, big moment where for the first time in Mark's gospel, 
someone says actually says who Jesus really is. Peter says, you are the Messiah. The kind of, we've kind of seen the disciples get Jesus wrong and wrong over and over again. There's something wrong. Their hearts are hardened. They can't, they have eyes, but they can't see. Then all of a sudden, Peter finally says, You're the Messiah. Okay. So, did anyone figure out why this weird miracle in the middle? What are these three scenes showing us? We've gone from not understanding to understanding. But why the miracle in the middle? Any ideas? Is it to show that that um, sort of movement from not, not not understanding to understanding requires a miracle from Jesus? Exactly. Who was that? Me, Lachlan. Ah, Lachlan. Thank you, Lachlan. That's exactly what it is. We've seen Mark use kind of this style of scenes with this background music throughout this whole section of Mark. And finally, it all comes together. So Jesus was the new Exodus, but people didn't understand. He was, he's the new Exodus for the Gentiles, but the disciples still didn't understand. What is their big problem? Well, oh, they need a miracle. They need Jesus to open their eyes. In fact, we kind of even get the answer to why we have this weird moment where uh, this blind man sees trees for a bit, but then has the proper miracle. Because what happens with Peter? He declares Jesus is the Messiah, but you can only see partly because straight after he declares him as Messiah, he tries to make him do what he thinks the Messiah should do, not what the Messiah is actually there to do. He kind of sees in part. But the thing I want us to see is that the problem has finally got an answer. This problem that has been the kind of dissonant chord in the melody of the Bible has finally got an answer. There is a difference with this new exodus and the difference is Jesus can open blind eyes. Jesus can open blind eyes. This new exodus is far, far greater than any exodus that has come before it. Because people's big problem, they were blind to see what God was doing this whole time. It was there, but they couldn't see it. And finally, Jesus, with his new covenant, new exodus, finally sorts out the problem. Because when he comes, by his spirit, he opens blind eyes. And this is really important because this is what gives us confidence when we do evangelism, right? This is what allows the CU to actually work. We have a message. Our message is that God has come to rescue from slavery for relationship with him. God has shown that message throughout history and ultimately through Jesus but what makes us believe that people will actually change? What makes us believe that people will actually open their eyes and see this message? Well, it's Jesus' promise that he will open people's eyes. Sorry, my mum has just started ringing me. <laughs> Not the right time, mum. Jesus opens eyes. 
And that's why we finally get this climax of the first of the first half of Mark, where Peter finally says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. But his eyes have been opened. There's a couple of things I want us to pray before we do a final close of everything. I think it's it's time we really thank God for opening up our eyes seeing who he is that he really is this god that has come to save and then we desperately need to pray for our friends and our colleagues colleagues other students at ucl pray that they would come to see this message that god has come to save even them even them gentiles and pray that he open blind eyes. Let's do that. Oh, the, do I need to send people into breakout rooms now? Guys, um, we're just going to close off with a couple of things. I hope you've seen that we've we've been uh, on a on a journey. But importantly, we've we've been on a journey that Mark wants us to go on. Um, if you turn back to Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 14 in your Bibles, um, we see this kind of introduction of this, this question, who, who is Jesus? Uh, some said he is John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others said he is Elijah. And still others said he is one of the prophets, uh, like one of the prophets of old. And then if we turn back over to our, our last scene that we just had, chapter 8, verse 28, we see the same thing. Who is Jesus? Is he John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? Or is he one of the prophets? And then we get this great declaration, but who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Messiah. And on the way, as we kind of watch this movie start and end, the scenes have come together with that background music to say, no, Jesus is the Messiah. And that means he's the Exodus Messiah. The, the God who rescues from slavery for relationship with him. And he solves the biggest problem people have. Their eyes are blind, their hearts are hard. He promises he will open them. And just to close, I just wanted to, to point out something that's quite cool, I think. Um, and that is that that melody, the melody of Exodus, carries all the way to the cross. The night before Jesus dies, it is Passover. And him and his disciples, they celebrate a Passover meal. But Jesus redefines it. He says, no, this meal now is actually about me. When you eat the bread, you're eating my body. When you drink the wine, you are drinking my blood. This is about me. The exodus is all about me. And then Jesus' blood is spread <laughs> On a cross, on a post, Jesus' blood, the Lamb of God, is spread on a post, just like the Exodus. And God's mighty hand, his outstretched hand, which brought wonders upon Egypt, or well now it is spread out on the cross, doing the greatest wonder of all. And even as darkness goes across the land, even as there's judgment, just like Exodus, Jesus takes it. And just like Moses took people through the kind of Red Sea out to glorious freedom and covenant relationship with him on the other side, Jesus does the same thing. He takes people through judgment and out to covenant relationship with him on the other side.
the melody of Exodus carries all the way through the Bible. It's what makes us understand Jesus, who Jesus is, and it makes us understand what he did. That the melody of the Exodus comes full climax at the cross. I hope you uh, enjoyed some of that this weekend away. I uh, hope it's made you think, made you see the glory uh, of our God, of our Saviour, a bit more. Um, and I pray that you might carry on kind of uncovering the kind of beautiful kind of melody that God has for us in his word. Uh, let me pray and then I'll hand over for the final time. Father, thank you so much that you have been creating this kind of beautiful music throughout history. Thank you that it's revealed to us who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Messiah. Father, thank you that you've, the melody of saving us has carried all the way to the cross. Father, thank you so much for opening up our eyes, for making us see, for breaking our hearts. And Father, I pray that you'd make us desperate to show other people this. And Father, would you open eyes at UCL, at SOAS? Amen.